Let's all lift our hands to the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day, God, that you've created, that this day that's been ordained by you, a special day. Lord, a day like no other day. And God, we just give you glory and praise. God, we pray for your anointing to fall in this place today. And from this day forward, God, may our lives be permanently changed and draw closer to you by your power. Father, we thank you for the plans that you have for us today. God, we just open our hearts and our ears and our minds and spirits to you, Lord, and say, Father, have your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. You know, before I, before I give the mic, I was just looking around, and we, we all can work together, and we all can play sports together. And what I'm seeing right now is, is, is heaven. Yes. I said, what I'm seeing right now Hallelujah. is heaven. I said, what I'm seeing right now is heaven. Somebody ought to give God some praise this morning. And we can all work together. Hallelujah. We can all play sports together. Why not we all come and worship together? Like the brother said, we all got the same blood. Red blood. The blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So we come today, we come to magnify him. We come to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We invite you to worship with us. Whatever the Spirit of the Lord has for you to do, amen. Feel free. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on, put your hands together.
great and mighty are you, Lord. Where are the worshipers in the house? Any worshipers? Why don't you just lift your hands to the Lord and begin to speak out of the depths of your heart what God is to you, who he means to you, what he means to you. Some people know him as a way maker, an awesome God. Hallelujah. We give ourselves away to you this morning, Lord. Our life is not our own. We honestly, Lord God, say, take our life, take my heart, and he is to be God. Give myself.
hear from you? Say yes. 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 This is what heaven is going to sound like. Come on, tell the Lord, yeah. Oh, God, your believers, your worshipers today, God, we say, say. Come on, one more time. Tell the Lord. Hallelujah. We say yes. Say yes. Say yes, Lord. I give myself away. Mm. Think about what that means. I give myself away. Your life is no longer your own. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on and open your mouths and tell God, I'll say yes. I'll say yes. With a free heart and a free spirit, God, we say yes. Come on. We lift your name on high, God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Come on, why don't you help us sing? Lord, I situation. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you came to say, Lord, you came. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead from the wall to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, Lord, I lift your name on high. Yes, Lord. Your name on high, God. Come on, somebody say, you came from heaven. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead, you came from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, Lord, I lift your name on high. Hallelujah. Come on, let's say that again. He came from heaven to earth. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death you came from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. I lift it up.
you just give God some praise in the house come on and magnify his name come on and lift him up come on open your mouths and lift him up hallelujah today. It's wonderful. We're going to go in prayer to God in prayer now. Psalms 103 and 3 says, He who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases. So Father, we thank you that all we have to do is just come to you and confess our sins that you do. You forgive our sins. And Father, I thank you that you are a healer God, we lift up every need that's represented in our bulletin today. Father, you know exactly what these needs are. God, you know if it's a physical need, if it's a spiritual need. Lord, if it's a relational, financial. God, we just bring these needs to you right now in the name of Jesus. And we ask for complete healing, Lord, and deliverance in the name of Jesus. And Father, any need that we have on our heart this morning, God, we just bring that to you, God. We thank you, Lord, that everything is in your control, Father. We thank you that we just come to you and just surrender it all, Lord, and that you just take care of everything, Father. And God, I pray that as Mike comes to bring your word this morning, that you will just anoint him, Father, as he opens his mouth, the words will just flow out, God. Lord, I pray that you will anoint our hearts, anoint our ears to hear and receive everything for you have, you have for us today. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Amen. So thankful for our fathers, our spiritual dads and our physical dads. We're so thankful for you. God is our father. Amen. He's our perfect example of a father and so thankful for, for that and thankful for each one of you being here today. I'm thankful, like I said, for, for spiritual fathers. If it weren't for spiritual fathers, many times those that are without fathers wouldn't have a father figure. And uh, we need fathers in our life. We need spiritual fathers. We need physical fathers. We need fathers who follow Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is so, so, such an awesome honor to stand here today and wish you all a happy Father's Day. Pastor Hughes, would, would you mind, I didn't tell him I was going to do this, would you mind stepping here with me? Uh, this, today just represents a big part of my heart. This is Pastor Hughes from True Life Ministries. God bless, you, God bless you. And it is an honor today to have you, Pastor Hughes, and your wonderful church family. You. Yesterday was 21 years, 21 years. That, that you have been here and baptizing people on St. Simon's Island. Absolutely. And it's such an honor for them to be part of us and us to be part of them today. And I just want to say welcome. Thank you. This house is open to you and your church family anytime. Thank you, sir. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Love you. I believe that God had ordained this day for a reason, and uh, the wonderful worship team, Miss Diane, Miss Monica, for you being here, and the musicians and the singers, amen. <laughs> Atlanta's not that far, is it, Pastor? <laughs> I'm sure you know that drive very well. 
And uh, it, is an, it really is. It's an honor to have you. My, my heart is, is for us to be able to love one another just like we've known each other all of our lives. And I feel that today. I certainly feel that today. And, and uh, y'all come back and be with us. I, I asked Pastor Hughes just before church started, I said, now, now this can be an annual event, right? He said, absolutely. And uh, are y'all okay with that? My only problem is I don't know if I can wait 12 months. <laughs> so it might have to wind up being a semi-annual event or something. I don't know. But, but amen, it's, it's good to have you. And any first-time guest here today, uh, it's just an honor to have you in the house with us to, today as well. And pray that you're blessed. This is God's house. And pray that God ministers to you in a special way. Our heart is for you to leave here closer to God than what you came. I, my prayer is today, my heart for you is that when you leave here today, you be more blessed and changed in, in the image of Christ, more so than you ever thought was imaginable today when you stepped on this property. And you know why? Because we're stepping into the anointing of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He's leading us today, and we're going to just, uh, I, I want to share with you a word that God has given me, but this is for all of us, to draw us closer to God. Is that okay? Amen. Today is part two of a series that I entitled, It's Who You Know. It's who you know. Many times in life, uh, if you want something done, many times you got to know a certain person to get it done. Sometimes there's a little favoritism shown. But aren't you glad that Father God, the Bible says that he doesn't show any favoritism to anyone. As long as we know him, that he'll bless his people. And that's what I want to talk about today is how we can get to know him. See, it doesn't matter how many people you know, who all you know. What matters is who you know. The right person is better than a lot of different people. Amen? I want to read a scripture to you and then we'll pray together. Philippians 3.10 says this, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that it is bread for our soul, that it's water, Lord, when we're thirsty. It's it, it, it helps us grow in you and mature in you. Father, I pray that today, God, that as we speak of your word, God, that you'll encourage us to grow in you, to draw closer to you, Lord, and to know you more. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it said, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So our pursuit to God and for God has to be on purpose. We can't just go through life and think, well, I know God because God's always with me. Well, there's a deeper understanding of who God is as we spend time and as we, the Bible says, diligently seek Him. It's just like one another. We know each other more when we spend time with one another. That's the definition of know. The definition of know is to have developed a relationship through meeting and spending time with someone. How can we know God? By meeting with God and spending time with Him. See, God loves you, and God wants to spend time with you, but we've got to want to spend time with him. He's, he's given us the ability to make our own schedules, to do our own thing, and, and, and many times we, we wind and, 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 and trail through life and don't really spend time with the one who has ordained our life and has the greatest blessings in our life. So I want us to talk about that today. See, if we have a firsthand experience of knowing who God is, nobody can take that experience from you. As I mentioned last week, we've been through many trials over the years. Our daughter had a brain tumor seven years ago. Our son was in a four-wheeler accident and, and busted his arm and his leg. And during those times, see, I know God intervened and brought about miracles in our life. And nobody can take that experience from me because I know the power of God. And so if, if God turns into be more than just knowing about him, but knowing him, then we have an experience with God that nobody can take away from us. One of our brothers, Brother Alan Lemon, a couple of years ago was in need because the doctor said he had cancer. And he was bound with cancer and, and was concerned. And we got together and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And today, because of God's answer in his life, he's no longer has cancer in his body. He's cancer free. <laughs> and so that experience that, that Brother Allen had, no one could take away from him. It was a time that he spent with God. He knew God. He knew God had a, a plan for him. He knew God had a healing for him. 
And so that's how we know God. We know that God's plan is great. You say, well, why did Brother Allen have cancer in the first place? Well, you know what? Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus Christ has greater power to overcome those things. So we know that we'll face trials. We know that we'll face tribulation in this life. But we've got to know God so much so that we have faith and trust in him that he'll bring about those things in our life. Even when we walk through them, sometimes we walk through the fire. But he'll bring us through that fire. Aren't you glad this morning? So there's a, there's a story in the Bible about Moses. And I want us to talk about Moses today. If, if you remember the story of Moses, he was placed in a little basket. Not, he wasn't very old. Placed in a basket and sent down the Nile River just to save his life so that he wouldn't be killed. And then Pharaoh's sister found this basket and saw this little baby and said, wow, I'll, I'll take this baby and cherish him and raise him up. And, and, and she did, and she raised him up. And then he found himself, he murdered a man, and he was sent out into the wilderness. So here Moses is in the wilderness, and he spends 40 years in the wilderness going around and around. And so he's 80 years old. And I want us to pick up there at this point in Exodus chapter 3, and I want us to break down the life of, of experience that, that Moses had with God, and I believe it will be an encouragement to us today. It says in Exodus 3, beginning with verse 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he, Moses, led the flock to the back of the desert. Look at that, to the back of the desert. If we were to ask certain people today, how is your relationship with God? Many would describe your relationship with God just as Moses recorded the story here in the back of the desert. Many times, as I said, we know who God is, but we don't know God. We feel like our relationship with God is distant. We feel like sometimes we're on the back of the desert. The desert is a dry land. There's not much life there. There's not much St. Augustine grass in the desert. There's not much water in the desert. And many times our relationship with God reflects that, is that we're in the back of the desert. But you know what? God still exists even when we feel like we're in the desert. And so this is exactly where Moses was. And it goes on to say that he came to Horeb and the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So Moses looked and beheld the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now, can, can you imagine Moses walking upon this burning bush. Now, it wasn't very uncommon for this to happen. In the desert, it was so hot, so humid, to when it got so hot it, during the day, many times a bush would catch, catch fire. But what was unusual about this is that the bush was not consumed. It would burn for a little while, and then it would be ashes, and people would go on, and, well, there, there was a bush that caught on fire and was consumed. But this particular bush kept burning and burning and burning, and Moses took notice of this bush burning in the desert that was not consumed. Did you know that God can use some strange things in your life to get your attention? God can use what we think is sometimes from the devil to get our attention. See, God loves you so much that he wants your attention to turned toward him. And whatever it takes, I heard one pastor say one time, whatever it takes, just shy of sin, we want to reach you. That's what God... God will go to any extension to reach the people that he loves. And so Moses saw himself here. And what's unusual is we don't see God doing many of the things that he did twice. Many times what he does, he do, he's, he's so creative. God can do anything he wants to do, including having a bush burn and not consumed. It says, then Moses said, I will now turn aside in verse 3. I'll turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw, he turned. Let me say, when we take the time to turn toward God, you're getting God's attention. That's really all God's after. He wants to turn your attention toward him. Why? Because he's got a better plan for you and me. He said, if I could just get their attention. Moses, if I could just get your attention, I've got a better plan for you. So he, he lights the match to this bush, and the bush is burning. And just about the time that Moses was, was going to walk past, it said that it caught his attention. And he turned toward the bush. Notice what happened when Moses turned toward that bush. It says that as he turned toward and turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush. God was so eager to speak a word to Moses that just as quick as Moses turned his face toward that bush, 
God said, Moses, Moses. God took notice. And Moses said, here I am. Man, that takes a pretty good amount of guts right there to answer a bush back, doesn't it? <laughs> here I am. I'd be tempted to say there I was, you know. <laughs> Moses said, here I am. Then he said, God said, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you are standing. You're standing is holy ground. See, God was letting him know that this is a very important time for you. You're, you're now entering into a time of revelation. You're entering into a time that I'm going to speak to you some things that I've been wanting to speak to you. All I needed to do was get your attention. See, God's got plans for your life. God's not up, God's not up out of heaven way yonder somewhere just wringing his hands and saying, well, I wonder, I wonder how I can bless Elder Diddy. I wonder how I can bless Elder Roth. I wonder what I can do for Brother Ganey. I, I, I wonder how I'm going to work this thing out in your life. See, God already has plans for you. God already has everything that you're concerned about. God already has it all ironed out. And he needs one thing. He needs your attention. We get so caught up in life. We, we have a lot of responsibilities. We, we, uh, we've, we've got a lot of single parents. and We've got a lot of uh, families that have two parents. But everybody's working today. Everybody is, is pouring their, their, their heart into working and making a living and being responsible. And... You know, so we get so caught up in life doing the things that we think we should do till we forget the most important thing in life, and that is to draw our attention to God. And He wants your attention. And when He gets your attention, when He notices that you turn toward Him, that is the very beginning of holy ground. Right there gives Him the opportunity to start, to start speaking that revelation in your life, that plan that He's always had for you from the day you conceived. God has a plan for you. God knew that you would be here today. God knew the moment that you were conceived. God knew the moment that you would be born. God knew the moment that you would be going through everything in life. And he's been waiting on you to turn your attention toward him. He was standing there that day. He was speaking through this, through this burning bush. And he said, Moses, take off your sandals. You're about to experience something in your life that you've never experienced. The moment of that experience, the moment of that experience, it will change your life. And many times we're afraid of that because it's the unknown. We're afraid of the future because it's unknown. So we, so we get into this little shell and we pull back and we become reserved. But God says, you know what? As long as I'm leading you, there is no fear that you need to have. He'll cause all things to work together for your good. It doesn't matter if you go through the fire. It doesn't matter if you go through the storm. He'll even part the waters for you. He'll work it all out. But there's one moment that turns the face of God, and that is the moment that you turn toward him. The Bible goes on to say in verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. We see that this is direct contrast if we were to look down in Exodus 33 and verse 11, a little ways down, it says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So something happened between Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus 3, Moses hid his face. In Exodus 33, 11, it says, Moses and the Lord spoke face to face. There's, there's a path that we must go down so that God can see us face to face. See, sometimes when God speaks to us, we're ashamed. We, we, we don't want to look at God. We say, well, God, you don't want to look at me. You, 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 don't, you don't understand. I, I'm a mess. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't want you to look at me. I don't want to see your, I don't want to look into your face, God. But there's a place that I believe that we can go through from chapter 3 to chapter 33, as Moses did, that we can experience God in such a great and powerful way that we can communicate with God, the Bible says, even as a friend. See, if we're not careful that we make excuses through life, we say, well, God, I, I will do that thing for you if this or if that. We make excuses. And we, I, I admit, we have some good excuses. We have some, we have some good excuses why we can't follow God. But I want us to look at some of the excuses that Moses had and apply to our life because I believe that we come up with the same excuses that Moses did. The first excuse is, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? 
See, Exodus 3, 11 and 12, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Do you know what that basically is? Moses had a wrong view of himself. See, the view of ourself can hinder us from knowing God. How we view ourselves can stop us, can hinder us from knowing God. Why? Because anybody here that does not have issues, I want to talk to you after church and spend next week with you. <laughs> We've got stuff. We've got issues. Everybody's got a past. The Bible says that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, so we, we, we all have things that God needs to speak into our life. We've all got things as long as we're on this side of eternity that we need to give to God and let him improve upon. Amen? Amen. And so none of us are exempt from that. We're all in this thing together. And we all need the help of God, all the help we can get, amen, some of us more than others. But, but if we're not careful, we allow our past, we allow our issues, we allow the view of ourselves, we allow our, uh, our limited knowledge of who God is, limit our belief in who God wants to be in our life. Does that make sense? And so we need to remember that who God, who does God say that we are? See, God wants to pour his character into you, and that's the way God wants to view you. God, see, perfect love casts out all fear. And, and the way God views you is an image of himself, the Bible says. You were created after his image. And so God sees you as a creation of him to bless you, to prosper you, to push you farther than what you could ever be on your own. I want us to look at something else here in the scripture. See, he wants to equip us. But it says in verse 12... It says, and this shall be a sign to you, Moses, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. See, the devil always wants to tell you that you're unworthy. The devil will always wants to bring up your past. The devil always wants to show you and tell you and remind you how imperfect you are. But God will never speak those things over you. God will always bless you and encourage you and push you to go on. And see, that's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God wants to prosper you in every way, in every part of your life. But if we're not careful, we're listening to the wrong voice. He's saying, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. What's the purpose in, in dreaming? What, what's the purpose in, in going for that thing? You know you can't do You know you're not good enough. All those things the devil is saying, and the God is sitting, sitting right there saying, listen, listen to me. Listen to my voice. Listen to my word. Because I want to encourage you that you can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you strength. There is no limit to your life. That's what God wants you to know. See, there's no limit on what God can do. There's no limit on what God can do. All we've got to do is look to him and know who he is. And that's the next excuse that, that Moses had. But how do we get past who we are? We've got to believe God's truth. We've got to believe his truth. That is the answer to what the devil wants to tell us. We've got to believe his truth because his truth always prevails. His truth always prevails. We've got to believe the truth and not the facts. You say, well, the facts say is this. The facts are I did this. The facts are, yeah, but the facts are not as big as the truth is. The truth is what God says that you are. The truth is what God says he wants to take you to. The facts may say, well, I'm limited. Uh, I, I may have a heart condition. I may have this condition. I may have that condition. See, the facts are all these things that, that we can read in black and white. But the truth is, God says that you can do all things through Christ. Amen. Titus 3, 4, and 5 says, But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appear, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's what he has done. Not what we have done. What he does outweighs what we do. Even when we make a mess of things, even when we turn things backwards, he says, okay, let me take care of this for you. Let me fix this for you so we can go forward. The second thing, the second excuse that Moses had was, who are you? Moses said, who are you? Many times we ask, our, ask God the same thing. God, who are you that you could do all these great things? We don't really believe who he is. Exodus 3, 13 and 14 says that Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, Tell them that I am who I am sent you. 
That's who God is. See, many times we, we're so concerned about what other people think that we cheat ourselves right out of the blessing. See, God, who are you? Who, who are you? What, what, what do I tell them? What, when they ask me who sent me, who do I tell them? Well, see, you just say that he sent me. I am sent me. Well, who's I am? I am's I am. He's everything. He's all. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. See, he can do anything. God is bigger than your situation. God is bigger than your challenge. God is bigger than the facts. And so we've got to believe God can do anything. That's the answer. Who are you, God? Believe that he can do anything. God can do anything. He's bigger. Listen, what do we talk more about? Do we talk more about the problem or do we talk more about God with the solution? See, many times what we talk about is, is where we're having a tendency to believe more. If we talk more about the problem and, oh, this is this and this is this and it's just, it's awful, it's bad. And then tomorrow when you see me, oh man, it's bad, it's really bad. I'm, I'm worried about this, this. Tuesday when you see me, oh man, it's really bad. That's all I'm dwelling on, that's all I'm talking about. But what if I said, you know what, I'm dealing with some challenges, but God. But God is bigger. But my God can take care of everything that I need. So what if I spent my time talking about how big God is more than how big my problem is? Because the truth is, my problem, no matter what it is, it's much smaller than my God. My God is bigger. Sometimes we can talk ourselves right out of a blessing. We can talk ourselves right out of believing God's word. It's still the truth, but I don't believe it. I'm not applying it to my life. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Listen, it says, there is what? Nothing too hard for you. Nothing. There's no exemptions. There's no little star at the bottom of a page here and says, except for this on Tuesday and Thursday. I love it when, when restaurants give discounts except for But there's no exemption here. It doesn't matter if you need salvation, healing, deliverance, whatever you need, it says that nothing is too hard for God. Nothing. Nothing. Aren't you glad? The next excuse Moses used, and some of us do, suppose they. Suppose they. But God, suppose they. Suppose they what? Just suppose they. Exodus 4, 1 says, then Moses answered to God and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Or suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Suppose they don't believe me. Suppose they don't listen. Suppose they don't like me. Suppose they don't let me in their little group. Suppose they, we put more stock in suppose they, what they think and what they're going to do more than what we think God's going to do. We want to be liked. We want to be part of the club. We want to be part of the, the in group. We want to be part of the social society. We want to do all these things. But you know what? God will bless you and give you favor right out of the blue. He will even cause the people of the world to shine favor on your life. And you don't know where it came from. Amen? <laughs> Suppose they. See, if you're waiting for the affirmation of the world, you'll be waiting a long time. If you say, well, I'll just wait and see if I get that letter in the mail, you might be waiting a long time. Why not go ahead and obey God and watch God work it all out miraculously? Why not go ahead and depend on God rather than suppose they? Why not listen to the voice of God rather than listen to the voice of those that are against you? God has a bigger plan for you. See, what they think really doesn't matter. What the devil thinks about you, are you, are, are you really going to base your life on what the devil says about you? The one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, you're going to put your confidence in that? Or are you going to put your confidence in God? See, see Moses said, you know what, God, if, what, what Moses is really saying, he said, this experience I've had, but, you, you know, if I go tell them that I, I walk up on this burning bush, and, and that's one thing, maybe they'll believe that, God, but then I tell them that, that the bush talks to me. I mean, God, I don't know what they're going to say, and then when I tell them I talk back to the bush... God, what are they going to say? They're not going to believe all that. They're going to call somebody, come pick this dude up. (laughs) 
We're worried about what they say, aren't we? John 12, 42 and 43 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in Jesus. But what happened? They believed in Jesus, but because of those backbiters, those people they call the Pharisees, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Jesus. Why? Because they were afraid. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Lest they lost their social standing. Lest they weren't liked as much as what they were Friday night. Much, you know, they, they, they may have some conflict here. So rather than doing that, we want to keep peace in the community. Jesus, you'll understand. I believe you, but you know, I need to side with my, with my people here. Verse 43 says, For they love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. That's a bad place to be in. Amen. It doesn't matter, it does not matter, church, what the world's opinion of you is. See, they killed Jesus. And in order for us to receive the reward that God has for you, the greatest reward, I'm not saying that we're going to lose our life. So be it. What I am saying that no matter what you face today, no matter whose opinion you go against, if you're following God, God will reward you greater than any man will reward you. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. That's the bottom line. How do we change the concern of suppose they? We trust God. We trust God. When we trust God, we're saying, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I do know you're going to do it. So many times we get caught up and say, well, God, what if you fail me? What if, what, if, what if you don't come through? What if I put my, all my trust in you and then I have power on my face and I'm embarrassed because you didn't come through? See, we get in all, all these things here where we talk ourselves right out of a blessing. But God said, I'm going to do those things. All you've got to do is trust me. It doesn't matter how I'm going to do it. Trust me and watch me do it. We think we've got to have it all figured out. We think we've got to have all the answers. We think we've got to have it all in a diagram and full color and, and see the clip right before it happens. You know, But God wants us to trust him. God wants us to have faith in him that he's going to bring these things about. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, a great familiar passage of scripture says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. That's a promise. That's a promise, and God will not stray from his promise. Paul said this in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Trust God's plan. The fourth excuse that Moses used was, I've never done that. I have never done that. <laughs> How can I do that, God? I, I have never done that. Why can't we trust God and trust his ability through us? See, back, back in my 30s, I'm, I'm 51 now, Pastor. And back in my 30s, uh, I didn't like the way that collard greens used to smell when I'd walk in or anything. But in my 30s, my mother-in-law fixed a big pot of collard greens. And I said, you know what? I'm old enough. To, I'm mature now. And I can try a pot of these. So I did. And man, I love collard greens. What if I had never tried those collard greens? See, God's got a blessing for you that if you do it the first time, you'll say, why didn't I try that earlier? Why didn't I do that earlier? Well, we've got to trust God. There will be a first time for everything in your life. But you know what? When you follow God, when you seek God and he gives you instruction, you're going to be so nervous because it's something that you don't have control over. God's going to have the control and he's going to use you to do a miracle. And that's when you can see God's hand at work in your life. Well, God, I've never done that before, but thank God I stepped out and I trusted you and I did it because now I'm receiving the blessing of God. So Moses thought that same thing. He didn't have any prior experience to this. You know what? He was not a public speaker. He didn't like to speak and he sure didn't like to be on a stage. And when they built this thing and said, okay, you're going to have so many thousands of people out here and you're going to build you a stage and all, he didn't want to do it. And God said, you're the one I want. You're the one I want. Because you know that you can't do it in your own self. This guy over here, yeah, maybe he's, he's got all this stuff together. Maybe he's real nice and polished. Maybe he knows what he's going to say. And maybe he loves the attention of the crowd. But you, you know you've got to have me to do what I want to do. So you're the one that I want to use. Amen? He doesn't want the one that's got confidence in himself. He wants the one that has confidence 
in God. That's the one he can use. And he'll bring a major blessing in your life for doing that. Then Moses said to the Lord in verse 10, Oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow to speak. He had a stuttering problem. It says he had, he was, he, he had a slow of, slow of tongue, the Bible says. God wants to use you into something that you've never done before. Never done before. And through that step of faith, which is what we've got to do, we've got to have a step of faith. We've got to trust God and step out. See, that step of faith requires you to step out of your comfort zone. That step of faith requires you to step outside of something that you know. Step outside of something that you have rehearsed and practiced. Well, God, I'm good for this. You know, I've practiced this part, but... I'm not comfortable with that at all. I don't want to do that. He said, well, that's what I want you to do. I want you to do that thing that you're not prepared for and watch me work. I want you to do that thing. And I want to show you how great and mighty the King of Kings is in your life. Amen? Amen. And so in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. In order for us to please God, in order for us to experience God, in order for us to know God, He goes on to say, he comes to God, must believe that he is. We've got to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. James 2.26 says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. And so the Lord said to him in verse 11 of Exodus 4, who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. That is the power of God. That's what God wants to do in your life. See, we've got to step out. We've got to to move out of our comfort zone. God doesn't expect you to do what he wants you to do in your character. He wants to give you the character of himself to allow you the power that you need. See, if we tap into the Spirit of God, if we tap into who he is, there's nothing that you can't accomplish. There's nothing that you can't do when you take on the character of God. It doesn't matter how big it is, how impossible it may seem. It's when we step out in faith. God, I'm going to seek you. I'm going to step out and I'm going to follow you. Even though it's a sacrifice for me, you know what? Obedience is better than sacrifice. It's when I step out and say, God, okay, I'm going to do this thing. And I'm going to test you and see that you are good. And that you're a God of your word. And you're going to bring this thing about. God doesn't want you stepping out on your character. God doesn't want you stepping out on your reputation. He wants you to use the things that he's given you and the miracle of life that he's given you to step out and to fulfill his calling. That's the step that he wants you to take, to step out on faith and watch and see if he will teach you his ways. It's who you know. Do you want a blessed life? It's who you know. Do you want the favor of God? It's who you know. Do you need a miracle in your life? It's who you know. Now, don't misunderstand me. God uses people. God uses people in, in our community and around. And God will, God will spread that favor, but it's because that we, that we seek God first, and then God will use those people. It's when we seek man first and say, okay, God, I, I tried that, but now I'm having a problem. So, so I'll come to you and see if you can work it out. See, we need to seek God first. We need to go to God first and let him deal with the heart. God can even deal with the heart of those that are in the world. Even the riches of those are laid up for the righteous, the Bible says. Amen? So whatever you need, whatever favor you need in your life, we're praying for, for a daycare right here at St. Simon's Christian Renewal, and we're believing God. But you know what? We're seeking God first. God, we need your favor on us to get this done. God, you open the doors that we need to walk through. You put us in contact with the people that we need to talk to. Rather than seeking man, rather than reaching out and seeing who, what contacts we can make, God will show you. God will show us who to talk to. It's who we know. It's the Savior, the King of glory. It's the one that we need to know. If, 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 you, if you need a healing in your body today, it's who you know. If you need a job, if you're, if you're down on, your, on yourself, if you're having a battle with your family, it's who you know. God wants to speak life into you today. Let's bow our heads together. See, today we celebrate Father's Day, but fathers, we, we, many times in our families, we have, we have a lady of the house that she has to carry the weight of the father because there's no, no physical father present. So I'm speaking to all fathers today, 
even the office of father. That God wants to give you the strength, fathers, to step into what God has called you to. And for every person under the sound of my voice, God wants to give you the strength and the courage to do those things that he has called you to do. There is nothing impossible for God. Exodus 4.12, as I've just read, says, Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. It's time to know God, church. It's time to know who he is. It's time to know that he's got a plan for your life. It's time to know that what he's going to cause in your life, it will be for good. And so, Father, right now, I just pray. I pray, God, that you'll speak to us. Speak to us right now, Father. Lord, I thank you that your plan for us today, God, exceeds what we were expecting. I pray, I pray God, that we'll, we'll have an open heart, God, to receive the abundance of love and of encouragement, God, that you've planned for us today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. There are four things that we need to do. We need to believe God's truth. We need to believe God can do anything. We need to trust God, and we need to take a step of faith. Those four things, as we do that today, and as we make that part of our life, God will bless, and God will, God will just bring some great things in your life, greater than what you ever imagined or dreamed. See, God is a God of abundance. God is a God of more. More. He, he, he's not running in a shortage of anything. What do you have need of today? God has got an abundance of that. He wants to just pour it over your life today to fill your life with his love, with his presence, with his favor, with his healing, with his salvation. God wants to bless you today to where you're overrunning. Not just scraping and scraping by, but God wants to bless you as we turn our face toward him, as we trust who he is, as we take on the character of God. No matter where you've come from or where you're headed today, turn your life to God turn toward him. It's when you turn toward him, God will say, now I've got revelation for you. I just need your attention to give you a word today. Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad?